Tonight, $100,000 unaccounted for at the San Salvador Post Office. The Auditor General says that's reason enough to launch a probe into the apparent money mishap. And as the fate of the Grand Lucayan Resort hangs in the balance, many wonder when the deal will be sealed. Tonight, a former board member of Lucayan Renewal Holdings speaks out. Plus, the foreign minister gives an update on the probe into the deaths of two Bahamians in Turin, Italy, still an unsolved mystery for many. And then in our news at 7.30, protesters and police clash, leading to the arrest of a political party leader. We'll tell you what happened next. Our news at 7 starts now. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Kendino Knowles. An Auditor General's report is tonight suggesting an investigation be launched into funds unaccounted for at the San Salvador and Rumkey Post Office, saying it could result in long-term losses. Bertany McDermott has the breakdown. The Auditor General's report for the period January 1, 2020 to October 30, 2021, examines the accounts of the Post Office in San Salvador and Rumkey. The report revealing that an examination of the monthly BOB bank deposits and the total remittance balance found a difference of more than $101,000 of October 31st, 2021. For the period, this chart shows the difference in the total remittance and the bank statements. February 2020 saw a difference of $11,986.77. March, a difference of $12,437.43. April, a difference of $3,287.97. August saw a difference of $9,360.31. February 2021, a difference of $5,168.90, and October 2021, a difference of $5,271.41. The Auditor General notes the difference could result in substantial long-term loss of funds and the potential for misappropriation due to ineffective internal controls. He recommends the outstanding amount be investigated and the internal controls relating to deposits and funds be strengthened and bank reconciliations be performed to address variances. The report continues monthly remittances were requested, but unofficial forms for 13 of the 22 months were received, which only represents 60% of the records. The forms were mainly used in rum key and some documents were incomplete, missing stamps, dates and other adequate information. The Auditor General notes this could result in potential misappropriation of funds and collusion. The report recommends that all remittances be recorded on official forms. Additionally, the nine-page report also states that DMO day sheets for May 2020 and November 2020 for the San Salvador District were not examined because the documents were not received. Additionally, DMO money order books for the correspondence months totaled $800 and could not be verified. According to the report, this could result in a lack of audit trail and the opportunity for misappropriation. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. Well, the leader of the Coalition of Independents, along with several of his supporters, finding themselves in hot water today after clashing with police on the steps of Parliament. Take a look. Party leader Lincoln Bain was one of several people taken to the nearby Central Police Station. He says his party's objective was simply to deliver his draft of an amendment bill addressing illegal migration in the country. We've got the full story coming up in our news at 7.30. A former board member of Lucayan Renewal Holdings Limited is speculating over the sale of the Grand Lucayan Resort following numerous extensions to the closing date. Attorney Kerry Leonard says he believes the delay is because negotiations on the heads of agreement are still not finished. You're talking about investing probably somewhere between two and four hundred million dollars. That's what I, I understand would be spent at the hotel. You've got to be able to to bring the the uh, guests in on a very on you know as soon as you're completed. So you need to be satisfied that if I'm going to put in three or four hundred million dollars, that when I've done that, I'm actually going to have the I, I'm guaranteed that I'm going to have a good airport and I'm going to be able to bring in my guests. 
Now, for more on the attorney's comments on the sale of the Grand Lucayan Resort, stay tuned for our news at 7.30 with Italia Hall. A gunman targeted a Nassau Street fruit vendor for a midday robbery on Monday. According to investigators, the incident unfolded around 12.41 p.m. when a man wearing a white t-shirt, black jeans, and a white shirt that covered his face robbed the victim of an undetermined amount of money. Police say the suspect escaped as he ran away. Also, a security guard who was arrested at the South Beach Library this week has denied firearm and ammunition charges. Prosecutors say 27-year-old Adrian Clark had a black Taurus GTC 9mm pistol and 12 rounds of 9mm ammunition in his possession on October 17th. The Toot Shop Corner resident denied the allegations at his arraignment before Senior Magistrate Darren's Roll Davis. He was granted $5,000 bail and his trial is set to begin on December 12th. Well, it's time now for your first look at temperatures across the country and meteorologist Greg Thompson, he is standing by in the Weather Center. Greg? Yeah, thanks, Candino. Of course, uh, all the clouds outside really indicating we have a frontal boundary that's pushing into the capital. Uh, mostly the northwest palm is actually partly cloudy skies to mostly cloudy outside. Temperature near the 80 degree mark, it's cooling down. We expect some cooler temperatures to be invading us by tomorrow. Your winds are now out of the north, northwest at 12 miles per hour, and that's bringing in that uh, cool air mass. Feels like 82 degrees on the outside. Taking a look at temperatures around the family of islands right now, it's 73, a very cool 73 in Grand Bahama, 76 in Alistown, Bimini, as well as in Marsh Harbor, Abaco. Over in Great Harbor Key, 79. Crossing Governor's Harbor, you guys at 81. 84 in Nicholstown, Andros. As I mentioned here in the capital, we are at 80 in the central Bahamas. Low 80s there, 83s in Kemp's Bay, South Andros. Deadman's Key, Long Island, as well as Coburn Town, San Salvador. We pick up 81 in Arthurstown, Cat Island, with some showers and some thunderstorms nearby. Georgetown, you guys are at 82. Deep South, into the Southeast Bahamas, 83s in Duncan Town, Ragged Island, with some showers as well. 83 also in Curl Hill, Cricket Island, and in Abraham's Bay. Delectable Bay, that's in Acklands, 85. Over in Turks and Caicos, you guys are the warm area, warm spot actually, 87. Matthew Town, Inagua, you are currently at 85. On our satellite, a lot of moisture associated with the frontal boundary. The frontal boundary is still across South Florida, it's now moving into the Northwest Palmas. But most of that moisture has been streaming across as we saw some really intense showers early this morning. Most of those showers have now tapered off, but that front is going to continue to push towards the Southeast. So we're looking at some more isolated showers, not heavy uh, as, as we had earlier today, but clouds will stay around and we will continue to see those cloudy conditions through tomorrow. That's your quick check on weather. Stick with us to look at the tropics and your extended forecast is still to come. Still to come on our news, the new Providence Road Improvement Project, a major overhaul of roadways in the capital, but a sore spot for many around the 2012 general election. Tonight, the former works minister speaks out on his legacy, and you'll see it only on our news. And why the labor minister says it's time for the increase in minimum wage. Plus, the new ambassador to the International Maritime Organization sets his eyes on getting the Bahamas back on top. We'll tell you how when our news returns. Now to a story you'll see on just one station. More than a decade ago, the new Providence Road Improvement Project was a sore point for the then governing Ingram administration. With cost overruns topping more than $100 million and works on nine corridors dragging on for years, causing misery for motorists, it was also a major talking point in the months leading up to the 2012 general election. And while there was outrage then, former FNM cabinet minister and recent national honoree Nico Grad says... Given the outcome, he believes the works were well worth it. But let me say right now that I never lost a night's rest over that project because I knew at the end of the day what it would be. And uh, I, I, I travel to Nassau occasionally now, and people walk up to me and 
but tell me how much they cursed me uh, for that project, but tell me how much they appreciate it now because it has improved the quality of life for them. That clip you just saw is from a recent sit-down interview with the former cabinet minister who also discussed being named a national honoree. Our Italia Hall has more on Grant's legacy coming up at 7.30. The Labour Minister says inflation was one of the main deciding factors in the Davis administration's decision to raise the country's minimum wage. Prime Minister Philip Davis announced the increase from $210 to $260 in his national address last week. Here's Keith Bell addressing Parliament today on the rationale. If we consider the period between the last increase to the wage by the Progressive Liberal Party in 2015 and now, it is noted that in the first six months of this year alone, the Department of Statistics reported an inflation rate of 6.6%, the highest rate we have seen in recent times. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the final analysis, the government weighed the balance and concluded that we must move to protect workers against unduly low pay and help to ensure a just and equitable share of the fruits of their labor. Bell says this year makes two decades since the Minimum Wage Act was implemented back in 2002 by former Prime Minister Hubert Ingram. He added that government also had to take into consideration Section 131 of the International Labour Organization Convention on Minimum Wage. As for those who think the increase is not enough? I wish to make it clear to persons who are employed, who work incredibly hard and cannot survive off the current wage of $210 per week. The government is not saying that you should only earn $260 or that the sum is adequate. No. Indeed, the government recognizes that the minimum wage must, in time, be transitioned into a wage that is appropriate for today's costs of living. Our newest ambassador to the International Maritime Organization is a familiar face. At the diplomats' reception on Tuesday evening, former police commissioner Paul Roll shared with R. Marlena Leonard his high hopes for his new position. Former top cop Paul Roll listed some strong goals as he gave remarks on his new position of ambassador to the International Maritime Organization. We used to be number one, but we now have Panama, Liberia, the Marshall Islands, Singapore, that have taken those top positions. Roll has been working with the Bahamas Maritime Authority since 2008, but shared he never expected to one day serve at this level. Now, he says he hopes to strengthen our maritime industry in hopes of diversifying the economy. As we try to grow and to maintain the sustainability of our commonwealth, maritime is one of the ways in which we are able to do that by continuing to expand and diversify our economy away from not only tourism. But Roll is realistic in recognizing that getting back to the top will not be as easy as it may sound. We have a long way to go to get up there because when you look at the number two position, which has about 3,200, uh, we stand at 15. So uh, how do you eat a, an elephant? Uh, one bite at a time. And so we want to incrementally work on increasing our market share. I, I think it'll be a little too aggressive to try to get into number one next year or the next year after that because that's, that's a, a long way from here. Reporting for our news, I'm Marlena Leonard. When our news comes back from the break, we turn our spotlight to stories making headlines across the world as four Trinidadian men are in custody for alleged drug possession and importation near St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Plus, why the foreign minister says he is still not satisfied after speaking with Italian officials about the deaths of two Bahamians in 2019. And the World Health Organization charging that COVID is still a global health emergency. It's all amid a call to keep your guard up. The details when our news returns.
This is our news. Welcome back. We turn our attention to stories making headlines across the world as Britain's inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years after UK food prices rose at the fastest pace since the 80s. Food jumped more than 14% in September. Staple items like meat, bread, milk and eggs lead the way. These numbers fuel demands for government to do more to help families and retirees. This is British Prime Minister Liz Truss struggles to keep down a hostile opposition and fury from her own Conservative Party. As she apologized to Parliament, opposition lawmakers shouted, resign. Tax-free shopping, gone. Economic credibility, gone. And her supposed best friend, the former Chancellor, he's gone as well. They're all gone. So why is she still here? I am a fighter and not a quitter. I have acted in the national interest to make sure that we have economic stability. The parents of the teenager accused of fatally shooting five people in Raleigh, North Carolina last week said they never had indications or warning signs. A statement from Alan and Elise Thompson said their 15-year-old inflicted immeasurable pain on the community. The October 13th shooting happened in a suburban neighborhood, leaving no motive and more unanswered questions. The Washington Post reports that the suspect remains in hospital in critical condition. He has not been named as he is a juvenile and has not been formally charged. A spokesman for the French government says the discovery of the body of a 12-year-old girl in a plastic box in the courtyard of a Paris building has left France profoundly shaken. A 24-year-old woman was arrested Saturday for murder, rape of a minor, torture, acts of barbarity, and concealing a corpse. A 43-year-old man is charged with helping to hide the girl's body, the French media identifying the victim only as Lola. News of her gruesome killing has sparked a vicious political debate after it was reported the main suspect was an immigrant who remained in the country despite a deportation order. Once again, the suspect of this barbaric act should not have been on our territory. And it was the case for more than three years. That's one too many. You won't be able to get out of the issue as you do in all situations. As the Minister of Injustice has done by crying out against political hijacking and attacking those who are outraged with this hackneyed argument. Too many crimes are being committed by clandestine immigrants one has not been able or willing to deport. And the United Nations voicing concern about the growing immigration crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. Hundreds of Venezuelan migrants were expelled to Mexico from the United States over the past week, prompting U.N. concerns that shelters are overwhelmed. A newly implemented U.S. policy returned 3,000 Venezuelans to Mexico under the bilateral plan. Now, Washington said it would grant up to 2,400 Venezuelans humanitarian access to the U.S. by air while enabling the U.S. to expel those caught trying to cross illegally at the border. We were already there. Why didn't they allow us to stay if we were already there? They should have put their hands on their hearts and think about us. I know that a lot of people have already entered, but many of us were left out. The most logical thing is, they could have given us a warning to say that by a certain date, there would be no access. People still cross the jungle, thinking they'll be able to cross. Everything is insane here. We don't know what to do. If I was deported, then send me to Venezuela in a plane. I would be calm in Venezuela. But they left us here at the border. What do we do? And four Trinidadian men arrested in waters off St. Vincent and the Grenadines trying to transport cocaine and ammunition. Police made the arrest a week ago, which also netted 330 grams of cocaine and 69 rounds of ammunition. Suspects range in age from 22 to 45. They were charged with multiple counts of possession and illegal importation. And here at home, Foreign Minister Fred Mitchell agitating for the completed report on the death of two Bahamians that reportedly drowned in Italy more than three years ago. Mitchell, who spoke with the Italian Honorary Council just this morning, had this to say. The ambassador in Washington has indicated that uh, if we would provide any additional information to them, uh, they'll do their best to try and resolve it. So 
Um, I'm going to have the foreign ministry follow up with them in the next day or so. Mitchell says, however, that he is still not satisfied. Literally, it's just taking too long, and we need we need to get it resolved. I spoke to the parents of one of the one of the parents uh, yesterday, so they're grateful that we continue to raise it. I'm sure it's like an open sore to them, you know. So we'll try, try our best. Nearly three years since the start of the pandemic, COVID-19 remains a global health emergency. That declaration coming from the World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus during a press briefing this morning. The committee's view is that COVID-19 remains a public health emergency of international concern, and I agree. The committee emphasized the need to strengthen surveillance and expand access to tests, treatments, and vaccines for those most at risk and for all countries to update their national preparedness and response plans. In January 2020, the WHO declared COVID-19 was a global emergency, and while cases are declining worldwide, the WHO chief says countries still need to keep their guards up. The virus continues to change, and there remain many risks and uncertainties. This pandemic has surprised us before and very well could again. Still to come in our news today in history, find out all the interesting facts about the day that was October 19th and the origin of Black Monday. Plus, Greg is back a little bit later on with your extended weather forecast. And then in our news at 7.30, protesters and police clash leading to the arrest of a political party leader. We'll tell you all about what happened when our news returns. Welcome back. This is our news. We will now turn our spotlight on events that shaped the day that was October 19th. Take a look at these interesting facts. On October 19th, 1987, the Wall Street stocks plunged a record 508 points or 22.6% on a day that has gone down in history as Black Monday. Here, floor dealers are seen busy at the Tokyo Stock Exchange with the 225 share index plummeted 709 points to 25,657 during the morning session. Brokers describing the drop as a reaction to falling stock prices on Wall Street and a weakening U.S. dollar. In 2019, HBO produced a series based loosely on the events starring Don Cheadle and Regina Hall. Then in 2005, ousted Iraqi President Saddam Hussein went on trial for charges of crimes against humanity. Hussein was captured by U.S. forces in December 2003 and remained in custody by United States forces at Camp Cropper in Baghdad, along with 11 other senior officials. Particular attention was paid during the trial to activities and violent campaigns against the Kurds in the north during the Iran-Iraq war against the Shiites in the south in 1991 and 1999. The year-long trial ended with Saddam being sentenced to death by hanging. Critics viewed the trial as one for show that did not meet international standards on the right to a fair trial. Then in 2003, Pope John Paul beatified Mother Teresa before a crowd of 300,000, calling her an icon of charity. A huge tapestry showing the smiling nun was unveiled on the facade of St. Peter's Basilica. It was an emotional moment for the thousands taking part in the ceremony. Then in 2012, speed skater Valerie Malte of Canada set a new world record in the women's 1,000-meter event. In this photo, Malte reacts to her world record performance during the ISU Short Track World Cup Championship in Calgary, Alberta.
All right, well, agriculture development, food security, data analytics, and entrepreneurship, just some of the topics UB students heard about this week at the first in-person career symposium since the global pandemic. Career and job placement counselor, Dr. Willissa Naomi Mackey says the aim is to enlighten students about various career possibilities. There are some students who are still looking those who are undecided and so hopefully they can use this as an opportunity something may pique their interest and steer them in the right direction social responsibility very important and so social responsibility data analytics not often talked about when you think about social media and entrepreneurship so hopefully this is something that will expand our students knowledge and give them some ideas about an area that they may be interested in without having known that they were interested in it among the guest speakers desante small focusing on the topic social media and marketing about 10 years ago, when I was graduating from college, um, marketing wasn't something that was popular in the Bahamas, and so now you've seen that grow. And I'm going to share with them how I've utilized the marketing and communications capacities uh, to grow my career professionally and also my businesses. And so I'm really looking forward to it because the fact that this is even a conversation speaks volumes of where the University of Bahamas is headed. To see that story again and for all of today's top stories, head over to our website, rnews.bs. That does it for us in our news at seven. Joining us now is our Talia Hall with the latest headlines. Talia, I wonder how many youngsters out there are looking to be journalists. Well, you never know. We had a really <laughs> promising group of UV students yeah. the other day, so maybe it's a big crop, and okay. that group is quite promising. Yes, well, a very busy day here in New Providence, but we also have news from my favorite city, Grand Bahama. A showdown in Parliament Square leads to the arrest of political leader Lincoln Bain as his party pushes its agenda. Now the party's deputy pushes for crime and immigration reform. Will the sale of the Grand Lacayan go through? It's the question our news puts to a former board member of Lacayan Renewal Holdings as the development on Grand Bahama hangs in the balance. And why the Prime Minister says intervention is key for Haiti as the Bahamas struggles with maintaining our own borders. And later, the former works minister stands his ground on the impact the new Providence Road Improvement Project had on the country. You'll only see it here on our news. Our news at 7.30 starts in a moment. Welcome to our news and thank you for joining us. I'm Natalia Hall. While well, topic news tonight, the leader of the coalition of independents, along with several of his supporters, finding themselves in police custody this morning. The COI party leader says the delivery of an immigration document was going smoothly until protesters and police clash. Megan Shepard has the details. Lincoln, Lincoln! No! 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 This was the scene outside of Parliament after what was expected to be a peaceful delivery of documents to Parliament, but that quickly spiraled into chaos. Leader of the Coalition of Independents, Lincoln Bain, says his objective was simply to deliver his draft of an amended bill addressing illegal immigration in the country. Bain says members of Parliament were receptive, however, police were not. That officer decided to push me, that officer decided to assault me, and then he decided to arrest me for no reason in the world. Other officers here witnessed the same thing. We were here with a purpose. Bain and several other supporters were subsequently arrested. Now, following the detainment of Bain, a crowd gathered outside of the Central Police Station, including attorney Maria Daxon. Daxon telling our news that the government of the Bahamas has started a fight that they intend to complete. What I'm going to tell uh, uh, this government, uh, only they can be seen as a bunch of lawsuits. 
As for that immigration document, Daxon explains the goal of the COI. They came here illegally, yeah. and all of a sudden, they want to rights in our country like all our organic behemoths, unacceptable. Now, during the recess of the proceedings in the House, the group returned to Parliament where Daxon attempted to deliver the document to Prime Minister Philip Davis. Here's his response. <laughs> Reporting for Our News, I'm Megan Shepard. Thanks for that report, Megan. Well, an audit at the embassy in Brussels, Belgium, reveals hundreds of thousands of dollars was spent on furniture and the overpayment of a luxury car for the then ambassador. Bertrand McDermott has more. The audit, which covers the period November 1, 2019 to July 7, 2022, finds more than $600,000 was spent to purchase furniture for the official residence in Belgium. According to the report, the High Commission in London assisted the mission with a 50% initial deposit of more than $300,000. It continues a second payment of just over $171,000 was paid, totaling $389,000. But that's not all. Additionally, payments were made from the Mission Belgium account in the amount of $97,700 and $13,000, totaling $108,138.16. The Auditor General recommends the Ministry of Foreign Affairs establish standards or policies for the purchasing of furniture for all residences and embassies, consulates and missions. It continues ambassadors should not solely be responsible for these functions but through consultation with the Ministry. The revelation comes four months after Labour and Immigration Minister Keith Bell revealed $500,000 was spent to furnish the ambassador's residence in Belgium. That's more than $100,000 less than Bell revealed back in June. At the time, Bell called it wasteful spending by the minister's administration. Then there was the overpayment on the lease for an official vehicle. The Auditor General also observed payments were made to the company Mercedes-Benz Financial Services for the lease of a luxury vehicle. It reads, the company was overpaid $6,130.78. Two payments were made by direct deposit in addition to a manual payment all in the month of August 2020. The report does not note the total cost of the car. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. Thanks, Berthony. While the closing date for the sale of the Grand Lucayan Resort has been extended to November, but it has many questioning whether or not the deal will actually go through. Well, I spoke with an, with an attorney, Carrie Leonard, who also sat on the board of Lucayan Renewal Holdings Limited for some three years. He spoke about what may be the reason for the delay of that sale and insists realistic dates should be made public. You've got to resolve the airport before you can resolve the hotel. Those comments coming from the Grand Bahama attorney and former board member of the Lucayan Renewal Holdings Limited, Carrie Leonard. The board Leonard once sat on is a special purpose vehicle created to oversee the sale and manage the resort's operations. He says while the sale of the Grand Lucayan Resort is critical, so is the redevelopment of the Grand Bahama International Airport. He believes that the slow movement with the airport is one of the reasons for the delay in the sale of the hotel. Leonard says unfortunately past and present governments have a tendency to put unrealistic timelines on major projects. While like the Grand Lucayne Resort. This is a complex transaction, as I said. You're going to need to have heads of agreement. They're going to need to do due diligence on an 1,100-room hotel that has a certain age to it. The varying buildings have different ages to them. That all takes time. And he says the redevelopment and sale of the Freeport Harbor is also key to Grand Bahama's success, adding that it was recommended before that the government should acquire the Freeport Harbor because Hutchinson Wampoa, the foreign company that owns the harbor, has been negotiating its sale for years. One has to realize that if Hutchinson can pull out of the uh, airport the way it did, uh, they can do the same thing with the harbor if the hurricane comes up the south and damages the harbor severely. And if these matters are not dealt with in Grand Bahama within the next two to three years, the attorney had this grim prediction. Then the government has an even bigger problem on their hands because you'll have probably a mass exodus back to, to New Providence, and I don't know where everybody's going to go then. If you analyze the economy of Grand Bahama, you will see that it has been the industrial sector, Pharmachem, Polymers, GB Shipyard, uh, Borco, all of those have been, and others, have been maintaining 
the economy of Grand Bahama. All right. Well, cloudy skies and cooler temperatures this evening. Greg Thompson is in the Weather Center with our current conditions around the islands. Good evening, Greg. Thanks, Italia, and welcome everybody on this cloudy Wednesday evening. Temperatures near the 80 degree mark. We have a lot of clouds out there, so we are calling it mostly cloudy skies. The winds are now out of the north northwest as that front boundary pushes towards the south, and they have picked up in speed 12 miles per hour, bringing in some cool air mass and your feels like temperature. A very comfortable 82 degrees. Satellite view. Big blow up of uh, cloudiness and some convection associated with the front boundary now pushing into this northwest Bahamas. A lot of those clouds produced some showers and thunderstorms early this morning here in the capital. We had like about almost an inch, half an inch to an inch of rain. Grand Bahama, the Abacos, you guys are getting in on that activity as well early this morning. That front will continue to sag towards the south and we will see cloudiness staying with us because the front is going to slow down. But those temperatures across the northwest Bahamas will cool down into the low 70s probably the upper 60s tonight. That's your first check on weather. Stick with us and look at the tropics and your extended forecast is still to come. Ahead on our news, the jury is selected. In the case of an Exuma tour boat explosion that killed an American visitor in 2018. Plus, how men and women can help strike a gender balance. A local sorority starts a discussion. And a Grand Bahama native receives national honors. Our news has its story and more when our news returns. jury has been selected to hear evidence concerning the tour boat explosion that left an American tourist dead and injured five others in 2018. Clayton Patterson Smith, the owner of Four Seas Adventures, which organizes boat trips in the Exuma Keys, and his captain, Roderick Watson, are being accused of criminal negligence concerning the June 30th tragedy. Smith and Watson are accused of manslaughter by negligence in the death of Malika Jackson. Watson alone is charged with, the negligent, with negligently causing harm to Tyron Jackson, Stacy Bender, Paul Bender, and Stephanie Schaefer. And Smith is accused of negligently endangering the passengers of the vessel by using inferior materials in its construction. Smith and Jackson have pleaded not guilty to the charges. Now, the nine-member jury will begin hearing evidence in the case on Tuesday. The defendants are represented by Muriel Ducille Casey. Raquel Wims is the prosecutor. Police are holding one of their own for a stabbing incident overnight in the West Ridge area. Reports reaching our news say a stabbing incident involved a police officer. He is a recruit constable who passed out in graduation exercises on Friday. Now the stabbing victim is another man who is in stable condition in hospital. This is a developing story. Talks about the crisis in Haiti have been ongoing during the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Diplomat Week. Prime Minister Philip Davis speaking on the sidelines at one of the events. The PM weighed in on the possibility of Bahamian boots being on the ground in Haiti. Marlena Leonard has the story. Between the assassination of their president last summer, rampant crime, continued high levels of irregular migration, and the new cholera outbreak, the crisis in Haiti has naturally been a focus of discussion amongst CARICOM leaders. After Tuesday night's diplomat reception, Prime Minister Philip Davis shared where the Bahamas currently stands in the talks. Well, the discussions are still continuing. We're trying to work out a strategic uh, position as to what has to happen. I think the consensus is intervention is necessary, but the manner in which and what scope it will take is still an issue for us to discuss. And if the United Nations follows through with a resolution to call for armed forces to create a humanitarian corridor in Haiti and work to loosen Haitian gang's stronghold of key areas, the Prime Minister affirmed the Bahamas would abide by the outcome of that resolution. In the meantime, the Prime Minister addressed the continued struggle with managing Bahamian borders and controlling irregular migration. Well, we have to keep continuing to keep vigilant and protect our borders and hope that the international community will come to the aid of Haiti and address some of the issues to stop the irregular migration. Reporting for our news, I'm Marlena Leonard.
while parliamentarians debating an amendment to the Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information Act. The act supports regular reporting by financial institutions and exchange of that reporting between countries. The Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development and Financial Action Task Force said in their last report that the Bahamas is not in full compliance with reporting regulations globally. The amendment to the Automatic Exchange Act will change this. Leading off debate on the amendment was Minister of State for Legal Affairs, Joel Campbell. A review was carried out spanning 2020 to 2021. This administration received a report regarding that review shortly after coming in office. The report stated that the Bahamas was in compliance in the effective and timely exchange of information. However, when it comes to the correct reporting of financial institutions, conduct due diligence and reporting procedures, the Bahamas was compliant in one area, but not in the other. Campbell says the Bahamas will look to become fully compliant next year. Meanwhile, opposition leader Michael Pintard says the Bahamas has been disadvantaged in the area of tax reporting by the unfair playing field that has been established by more developed countries. We have, by and large, sought to be compliant and to assist in protecting the global financial system from misuse. Having said that, I certainly stand by the assertion that any attempts by this administration to deflect on what they did not execute in a timely fashion is not justified. When our news comes back from the break, a sorority tackle gender balance in politics, why they're targeting men and women for the conversation. Plus, coming up in sports for this evening, the UB Mingos now 4-0 in BFA play. We'll tell you how they did it. We'll also tell you how the New Providence Softball Association Championships are rolling along. That's all coming up in sports tonight. Plus, a former MP reflects on his legacy after he receives a national honor. We sit down with Grand Bahama native Nico Grant when our news returns. This is our news. Welcome back. The ratio of men to women serving in politics is small in the Bahamas. It's because of that members of the local graduate and undergraduate chapters of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated have chosen to host a seminar. The discussion will feature former Attorney General Allison Maynard Gibson, State Minister for the Public Service Pia Glover Roll, Free National Movement Senator Michael Barnett Ellis, and former FNM Senator Jennifer Isaac Dotson. Now, when asked why they decided to tackle this topic, Social Action Committee Chair Shakira Roll said this. We are advocating for a percentage of about 30% women representation in political positions, and we feel that that will level the playing field in terms of input, um, bringing objectives to the table that affect women in society and bringing more focus to those issues um, by having a voice at the table. Co-chair of the Social Action Committee, Astra and Bristol Roll shares why the University of the Bahamas was selected to host the discussion. She also outlines the importance of men attending the discussion. We believe that the university is a great neutral ground. Um, it's also a ground where that represents research. Uh, and a lot of the policies that Delta Sigma Theta is assisting in, in driving happens through research. It, that's where it starts. We're inviting men to attend, to listen and hear what some of our challenges are and see how they can, too, 
join us in the fight. Now, there are currently only seven women sitting in the House of Assembly and four serving in the Senate. The discussion is scheduled for Thursday, October 27th at the Harry C. Moore Library at the University of the Bahamas beginning at 6.30 p.m. While the UB Mingos continue their unbeaten march through the soccer season, meanwhile, the new Providence Softball Association rolling along with championship play. Here's Marcellus Hall. All right, thanks, Natalia. Welcome to our sports, everybody. I'm Marcellus Hall. To say the UB Mingos have started off their season on a good note would almost be an understatement. That's because so far, through four games, they are now 4-0 and after this weekend's last contest. Let's take a look and see exactly how they got to that point. The UB Mingo soccer team had thought the biggest challenge so far in the Bahamas Football Association season was going to be against the Bears FC. However, this was not the case. Mingo's taking on depleted Bears team over the weekend. It played out just as expected. Bears missing their top player because of a previous red card. Despite a physical game, Mingo strike first with O'Brien Hines scoring in the 6.15th minute. Midfielder Ronaldo Green comes through in the 22nd. That gives the Mingos a 2-0 lead at the halftime. Bears score a goal on the Mingos in the 56th minute, but Green responding in the 57th minute to get the 3-1 lead. He would go on to score a hat-trick plus one in the final minutes as the Mingos win 5-1. They take sole control of the top spot with a 4-0 record. It was a brilliant win, but granted uh, Bears missing a few players due to red card due to these soccer games coming up, but we came out and did the job. Uh, we kept the ball moving. As a team, we learned from the mistakes in our previous games, and we came out and did what we had to do. Meanwhile, the New Province Softball Association Championships continuing last night. Ladies open it, ladies Wildcats. They beat the RB operators 12 to 7. They take a two games to nothing lead in that best of five softball championship series. Meanwhile, on the men's side, the Cyber Marlins being the Hitsman. Boy, this was a blowout. 16 zip ends up being the final. Men's series now tied up with one game apiece in that best three of five. And there it is. You look at sports for you on this Wednesday. I'm Marcellus Hall. Back to you, Italia. So ahead on our news tonight, a former works minister reflects on his legacy in one of the largest road projects in the country's history. And don't put those umbrellas away just yet. Your extended weather forecast is coming up when our news returns. Welcome back to our news. Stray thunderstorms are on the radar as we make it through the midweek. Greg is back in the Weather Center with your extended outlook. Greg. Thanks again, Natalia. Welcome back, everybody, for our final check on weather. Take a look at the water vapor. We have a very strong cold front now moving into the northwest Bahamas. Moisture associated with that front generating some clouds and some showers and thunderstorms across the northwest and central Bahamas. The frontal boundary will continue to sag towards the south and east, should move into the central Bahamas and eventually stall before a low pressure system develops along that boundary by the weekend. But behind that, a nice dry air mass will be invading our area, so we're looking at some pleasant and cool temperatures for the northwest Bahamas, especially extreme northern islands, Grand Bahama, Abaco, and the Bimini areas. You guys are looking at some nice improving conditions by the end of the week. That frontal boundary stretching all the way into the Atlantic. High pressure behind that will build across us. Breezy conditions expected early portions of tomorrow, but winds expected to fall off. In the tropics, everything is quiet over there. A couple of active tropical waves, not showing any tropical development at this time. So the tropics will remain quiet for the next five days. Boating forecast for the Northwest Bahamas tonight through tomorrow. Caution flag in place for you guys. Your winds will be north to northeast at 15 knots. Seas running three to five feet over the open waters. Low tide will be at 10.40 tonight for the central and southeast Bahamas. South to southwesterly wind flow at 10 to 15 knots. Seas running two to four feet over open waters. Here's a look now at your national forecast. In your seven day forecast, that frontal boundary, as I mentioned, will stall across the central Bahamas. Some clouds and some showers still expected with the boundary across most of the islands. But by the end of the week, we expect conditions to be improving. But through the next couple of days, some very nice temperatures expected across most of the islands. That's a look at our weather. Make it a safe night, everybody. Thanks, Greg. National honorees were recognized for their contributions to nation building on this past National Heroes Day honored were people from various sectors across the country. Among them is former Free National Movement parliamentarian Nico Grant, who received the Order of Distinction. My life has been one of service. 
National honoree and former FNM MP Nico Grant was born in West End, Grand Bahama. He left in 1968 and moved to New Providence to further his education. His career began at Bahamas Airways. From there, he moved on to several reputable companies holding top positions. Grant was also actively involved in the sporting community as well as service organizations in Grand Bahama. He says he was asked in 1987 to join frontline politics, but he had no interest at the time. I had two children that I had promised to educate. But in 1991, he was approached by former Prime Minister Hubert Ingram in Abaco, and that is when he told him that he was ready to enter the political arena. Went on to be officially nominated for the new constituency of Lakaya, won that in 19... 92, August 19th to be exact. He says in total he served for 25 years as a member of parliament for that area, which gave him the title as the longest serving member of parliament for the FNM. Now he admits that there were some difficult days as the Minister of Public Works and Transport, as he says he caught a lot of flack for the new Providence Road Improvement Project. Let me say right now that I never lost a night's rest over that project because I knew at the end of the day, what it would be. And uh, I, I, I traveled to Nassau occasionally now, and people walk up to me and would tell me how much they cursed me uh, for that project, but tell me how much they appreciate it now because it has improved the quality of life for them. The former cabinet minister says the current political climate in the country leaves much to be desired, and he believes that some people enter politics for the wrong reason. You must be sound financially or you're going to do nonsense because the demand is great. And as for what's next, while well, Grant says following the death of his daughter in 2009 and son two years ago, his focus is on his grandchildren. My three grandchildren keep me fully occupied. Well, thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Natalia Hall. We'll see you tomorrow night. Have a great evening.